Hello and welcome back to the Timmer Podcast, a show where you and I explore the life, conquests, character, and legacy of Amir Timmer. It's been a little longer than two weeks since our last episode, and I do apologize for that. I'm still trying to figure out this life work podcasting balance, uh, but we are getting there. Um, two weeks ago, I was pretty sick, so I, I didn't want my recording to be super nasally. But here we are, and this episode is extra long, so hopefully we make up for that. Speaking of, two very quick housekeeping things before we get started. This episode is long. It's it's over 10,000 words or so in my Word document. Thus, I'm probably going to split it into two episodes. So if the narrative kind of ends abruptly, I meant to do that. I just didn't want this episode to be 35,000 hours long. Uh, But don't worry, both episodes will be released today. Secondly, I am happy to announce that the Timber Podcast has an official Patreon account. I've actually had a Patreon since I started the show all those years back, but this is the first official announcement. Uh, So for those of you who don't know, Patreon, spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N, is a website that allows listeners to donate money to content creators like me that is then collected and distributed every month. It's pretty easy to use and you can pledge any amount you want. And I'm not going to lie, money is a little tight, the show takes up a ton of time and effort, and it does cost a little bit of money to run. So any and all doma- donations, Dalmatians, Dalma- you can donate Dalmatians too, but donations are much appreciated. Um, but real quick on that, if money is tight for you too, please don't donate anything. Take care of yourself, please. And secondly, if you're worried that this show may eventually cost something in order to listen to it, Do not fear, the Timmer Podcast will always be free. But enough of that awkward conversation, let's just jump back into the story of Timmer. We have a lot to cover today. This is a pretty pivotal time period in Timmer's reign, so let's get started. When we last left Timmer, it was the year 1376. Timmer had recently yet again defeated the Mughals to the east, but yet again, Mughal Khan, Khan Kamaruddin, had escaped. Or, as Timur's alleged autobiography beautifully puts, Kamaruddin had escaped from the whirlpool of death. Then, on Timur's return back home, he learned of the death of his own son, the young prince Jahangir Mirza. And this loss was quite a a huge blow to Timur, for as we're told, the whole kingdom went into mourning, and Timur himself found it difficult to even attend to the governing of his young empire because of his overwhelming grief. But... Unknown to Timur, and as I hinted to uh, last episode, where one son was lost, another might soon be found. Or possibly two, actually, as we will see shortly. But anyways, after some time of seeing their emir do nothing but grieve, Timur's advisors finally came before him and begged him to lead them again, to take up the responsibilities that they believed God had given him. And... Eventually, Timur fulfilled their wishes and returned to leadership in the way you might have guessed he would. As Yazdi tells us, He therefore began to apply himself to the affairs of the empire and immediately ordered the army to get ready to march. There was unfinished business with the Mughals and the Khan Kamaruddin in the east, but before we can jump into this invasion, another minor but important inc- occurrence takes place here. We are told that Adil Shah Jalair, who, if you'll remember, was a man who had rebelled against Timur multiple times and then had also aided Timur's enemies, the Mughals, well, Timur received word that this man had been seen near the town of Otrar. And we're given two different accounts of what happens next. Timur's alleged autobiography tells us that Adil Shah was seized by local Turks who killed him and that Timur had nothing to do with that. And, yeah, maybe that was the case, but our more reliable sources tell us that upon hearing where Edoshal might be, Timur sent 15 soldiers, or possibly assassins, to end the career of this troublesome man once and for all. And this was done. Edoshal was killed upon Timur's orders, and his holdings and leadership in the Jalair tribe were handed over to more loyal men. And thus ends the story of Edoshal Jalair. But now that that loose end was resolved, Timur again prepared for war. What follows is the fourth, or 
some sources say fifth, invasion of Mughalistan in 1376, less than a year after Timur's previous invasion here. But in contrast to that invasion, Timur did not personally lead this expedition. To do this, Timur sent his son, the Prince Umar Shaikh Mirza. Now, we're going to talk a lot about Timur's sons in this episode, so here's a very quick recap to help us with this confusion. Timur will have four biological sons. There's some debate as to who the eldest son was. It was either Jahangir, who died in 1376, as we saw last episode, or this prince we just mentioned, Umar Shaikh Mirza, both of whom were about 20 years old by 1376, where we are now. Uh, they were born to different mothers, of course. Uh, Timur also had a third son at this point, who we haven't mentioned, at least I don't think we have. And this was the young prince Miran Shah, who had been born around the year 1366. So he was only about 10 or so years old with where we are in the story. Timur later had a fourth son born to him, who we will meet later in this episode actually, as well as an adopted son, who we will also meet very soon. But hopefully that kind of clears things up for the both of us. Um, also, if you can hear my cat snoring in the background, I apologize for that, but I, I just don't have the heart to wake him up. He's happy where he is. Anyway, Timur's eldest living son, Prince Umar Shaikh Mirza, led this fourth, or possibly fifth, invasion of Mughalistan. And the invasion goes pretty well for Umar. The Timurid forces find Kamaruddin, and the two armies engage in battle. Muhammad Haidar gives us a descriptive quote about this battle. He describes it with this. In the desert of Karatu, they came upon Kamaruddin, and by the aid of the Almighty, their swords of emerald became ruby-colored like pomegranates. But, yet again, Khan Kamaruddin escaped from the clutches of Timur's forces. He really did have that ability to evade the whirlpool of death. Still, though, Prince Umar had been victorious, and this victory allowed him and the Timurid forces to lay waste to much of the Mughal countryside. Yazdi reminds us that this pattern of plundering, with the quick little sentence of, and soon after the victorious army returned laden with spoils and slaves, as usual. So this victory encouraged Timur himself to join the invasion, which he did with the main contingent of the army. There was some minor skirmishing between him and Mughal forces, along with more plundering and looting, of course, but that's about all that happened. The fourth, or some sources say fifth, invasion of Mughalistan had been a tactical victory for Timur, but Khan Kamaruddin had escaped and was still at large. Timur and his forces returned back home to Samarkand, and this is when the story of Timur really takes a huge leap forward. Because so far, Timur's reign and conquests have been impressive in their own right, yeah, sure, but also somewhat underwhelming. And yeah, it's pretty easy for me to say that sitting here in my armchair. But his affairs have been somewhat localized, mainly dealing with his immediate neighbors to the east, the Mughals, and then his immediate neighbors to the northwest, the Sufi dynasty of Khwarezmia. But although Timur has beaten both several times, he did not conquer either of them, and his sphere of influence or control really hadn't expanded past Mawaranar. But what happens next is what, in my opinion, began the transition of Timur from being just kind of a local warlord in Central Asia to the beginning of a world player, and as one of his many titles suggest, a world conqueror. We are now well into the year of 1376. Timur is at his capital of Samarkand when a man, probably in his mid-30s or so, arrives at Timur's court. This man is known to history as Tokhtamish, and he will be one of the main characters, if you will, of Timur's story and of this podcast. As such, it's pretty important that we know who this Tokhtamish is, and to do that we do need to do a bit of backtracking. So let's pause this scene, if you will, of Tokhtamish humbly entering Timur's court. Let's pause that and dive back a hundred or so years. Now, I, don't worry, I'll try to make this as quick and as non-confusing as possible so we can get back to what's happening, but here we go. <sighs> 
Several years ago, when this podcast began, we covered the history of the Mongol Empire. How, under the leadership of the four great Khans, Genghis, Ogadai, Guyuk, and Monk Khans, the Mongol tribes had been united and went forth to create the largest empire the world had ever seen. Stretching from Syria to Poland and Hungary, across the Eurasian steppe, across Persia and Central Asia, all the way to the Sea of Japan and China in the east. In order to avoid infighting and to help govern this vast empire, the Mongol Empire was split into four parts, or the four Khanates as we call them. But with the death of the final Khan, Monk Khan, in the year 1259, the Mongol Empire split along these four divisions. And although the Khanates would sometimes work or ally together, they would never be fully reunited and often even fought amongst themselves. Each Khanate fared differently. The Ilkhanate, the Khanate that covered much of Persia and the Middle East, was the first to fall apart. By 1335, it was pretty much gone, although some pretenders still did claim the title, but for all intents and purposes, it was gone. The second Khanate, the Yuan Dynasty centered in China, was pretty much all but removed by the year 1368. Although, again, remnants of it did remain in places like Mongo Mongolia, Magnolia, Mongolia, there we go. Uh, the third Khanate, and the Khanate to which Timur was born in, was the Chagatai Khanate, which consisted of much of Central Asia. But with the death of its Khan, Tughlaq Timur, in 1363, this Khanate was split in half, with Mawarnar in the west and Mughulistan in the east, as we've talked about many times. Thus, by the time Timur was made a mirror of Mawarnar in 1370, three of the four Khanates were pretty much gone, or only remnants. And as we talked about, each of these three Khanates had collapsed due to a whole host of interior and exterior factors. But in the end, one of these biggest factors was that, was that the Mongols had won the military war in each of these regions, but had lost the cultural war. To oversimplify this, uh, the Ilkhanate was influenced heavily by Persian and Arab cultures, among others, of course and then most importantly, saw Islam become the overarching cultural power. In the Yuan Dynasty, even while the Mongols were still ruling, Chinese influence had permeated every aspect of Mongol life. And by the time we reached the greatest Yuan ruler, Kublai Khan, even his leadership was overwhelmingly fashioned after Chinese culture rather than Mongolian. In the Chagatai Khanate, the Mongols were, as it is sometimes described, Turkicized. There were many similarities between the Mongol nomads and the various Turkish nomads, but there were also key differences, such as the history of the Chagatai Khanate being the home of many previous settled empires, as well as, again, the influence of Islam being present. However, by the time Timur took the throne in 1370, the fourth and final Khanate was not only still around and kicking, but it had been flourishing. And this, of course, was the Golden Horde. And as we covered many, many episodes ago, the Golden Horde ruled over the steppe lands stretching from Poland and Hungary in the west, across Ukraine and the various Russian principalities, and all the way to the lands around the Aral Sea and the northern Caspian. There were, of course, many factors that had allowed the Golden Horde to remain powerful where its brother Khanates had fallen, but one of the major factors is that Mongolian culture was able to stay more intact. The land here, just like back home in Mongolia, was steppe country. Nomadic tribes were free to roam in any direction they wanted to, and they were able to rule from the saddle. Unlike the other Khanates, this land was not broken up by mountains and deserts and hills. This was the vast steppe. Further, while there were many cultures present here before the Mongols, none of them had really been as solidified or as powerful as, say, Chinese or Persian culture. The various nomadic tribes and Slavic peoples who were living here, they were the ones who would, at least, initially lose much of their culture war to the Mongols. But anyway, let's do a very quick recap of some Golden Horde history. The Golden Horde was initially founded by Batu Khan, who was a grandson of Genghis Khan. And to rule over the Golden Horde in a more organized way and efficient way, Batu divided the Golden Horde into two separate halves. These halves are referred to as the White Horde and the Blue Horde. Thus, when one had control of both the White and Blue Hordes, he would be Khan of the whole Golden Horde. Confused yet? 
I hope you're not, because now we're going to get into some of some of the, uh, some, I can't even talk some of the most annoying and confusing historical terminology that I've come across so far for this podcast. So just where were these this blue horde and the white horde situated? Well, I can tell you that one of them was the eastern half of the Golden Horde, while the other one was the western half. As to which one is which, that's anybody's guess. Because it turns out that pretty much every source you'll come across, primary source written 600 years ago, or even secondary sources written in the past decade, none of them agree on which half was the White Horde and which was the Blue Horde. The names are used completely interchangeably. There are even certain sources that switch the description mid-chapter. Even a few recently written articles I came across did this. It is infuriating and so annoying. But wait. There's more. So it turns out, sometimes instead of breaking the Golden Horde into this blue and white parts, they will be called the left wing and the right wing of the Golden Horde. And when I came across this, I was so happy to just leave the color descriptions behind because I could just use this left and white wing terminology instead. Because obviously, the left wing refers to the westernmost part of the Horde, while the right wing refers to the eastern portion right? No, it's the opposite. The left wing is in the east and the right wing is in the west. What is going on with these descriptions? And trust me, if I could tell this whole story without breaking the Golden Horde into its two different parts, I would. But the problem is the story of Tokhtamish and Timur is inseparable from this division. So where does that leave us? Well, for the sake of consistency and hopefully avoiding as much confusion as possible, I will not refer to the two halves of the Golden Horde as the left and right wings or the blue and white hordes. Instead, I will very simply call the eastern half the eastern half and the western half, you guessed it, the western half. I really do wish there was a better way to do this, but for now, unless you hear me say something different in the future, this is how things will be broken down for us. Good? All right, great. Let's get back to the narrative. So the Golden Horde was able to stay powerful and intact for several decades. Much of this was due to the resilience of Mongolian culture here, the lack of any real united enemy nearby, and a host of very effective Khans, most of whom we covered way back when. For example, Johnny Beg Khan ruled from 1341 or so until 1357, and he was able to carry the Golden Horde through such trials as the Black Death, or dealing with the pesky quarrelings and uprisings of various Russian princes. When Johnny Beg died in 1357, his son Birdie Beg took the throne. To consolidate his leadership and to make sure that there were no other claims for his throne, Birdie Beg killed all of his close male relatives right away. We're told this included 12 men and boys, his closest relatives, including even his 8-month-year-old brother. Now, as reprehensible as this is, it's not necessarily a bad idea if you want to keep your throne safe from familial claimants by any means necessary. Unfortunately though, morality aside of course, there is one big glaring potential issue with this plan. If you are to die and you have no close male relatives, who's going to take your place? And this is, unfortunately for Birdie Beg, exactly what happens. Only after two years of ruling, Birdie Beg died in 1359, either from sickness or possibly from assassination. And this begins a 20-year-long period of civil war and anarchy within the Golden Horde, a period often referred to as the Troubles. This 20-year period would see no less than 25 different guys claim the conship of the Horde, and they would come and go in different ways. Oftentimes, the Golden Horde was broken into its two halves, with different Khans leading both sides. And then on top of that, the Crimean Peninsula pretty much broke away from both halves of the Horde and became a third portion, led by a powerful tribal leader named Mamai. Add to this that the outside forces surrounding the Golden Horde had been growing in strength. 
One of these powers was the new but powerful Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which had, been, which had been expanding at the expense of Mongol territory and had even defeated a Mongol army in 1362 or 1363 at the Battle of the Blue Waters. This battle saw Kiev fall under Lithuanian control. Add on to that that the many Russian principalities and cities that had been enduring the Mongol yoke for a century were really starting to cause problems for the Horde, and were even sometimes trying to break free from them altogether. One of these little Russian kingdoms, a small city called Moscow, was really starting to find its political identity and power and was a constant thorn in the side of the Mongols. So this is the state of the Golden Horde for about two decades. Leaders come and go, but none of them are really able to fully reunite the, the Golden Horde. Because to reunite the Golden Horde, you really got to do three things. First of all, you have to rule both the western half and the eastern half. Secondly, you have to either subjugate or defeat that tribal leader Mamai who was set up in the Crimean Peninsula. Mamai was never a Khan, and he never claimed to be Khan, but he is described as a Khan maker, because his political influence was just that powerful. Thus, you gotta either have him on your side, or you gotta take him out. And finally, to unite the Horde, you must control the capital city. Because yes, although the Mongols did maintain many of their nomadic ways here, they did establish a capital city. This was the city of Sarai, which sat on the Volga River. And we'll talk a lot more about Sarai in the future, but for now, we'll leave it at that. So anyway, those are your three tasks in order to reunite the Golden Horde. And like I said, many men tried to do this, and many men effectively failed. 25 cons in 20 years. One of these men was a man named Urus Khan, who ruled the eastern half of the Golden Horde from 1369 until 1377. Urus Khan was a very effective ruler and was even able to check off some of those points on our Golden Horde bingo checklist. He ruled the eastern half, he was at times able to partially subjugate the western half, and he took the capital city of Sarai. And then he lost it. But then he took it again. And then he lost it again. And this happened a couple of times because Urus Khan was unable to subjugate Mamai in the Crimea Peninsula. And, of course, there were always new claimants for the throne popping up in every corner. Thus, for two years, Urus Khan could technically claim that he ruled both the eastern and western halves, but he was really unable to effectively and permanently reunite the Golden Horde. But even so, our story and introduction of Toknamish begins with Urus Khan. So during Urus Khan's career in the 1370s, he is again preparing his army to attempt to recapture the city of Sarai. To gather forces, Urus Khan asks his cousin, a man named Tai Kwaja, to help gather troops. Tai refuses to do so for reasons we don't have, unfortunately. So Urus Khan just kills his cousin. But Twai had a son, and you guessed it, his son's name was Tokdamish. Tokdamish, who was probably about 28 years old or so at this point, upon hearing about his father's execution, flees. However, after some self-reflection and probably realizing that he had nowhere else to turn to, Tokdamish returned to his uncle Urus Khan and asked for forgiveness. Urus Khan granted this forgiveness and welcomed, welcomed Tokdamish back into the fold. And I'm just realizing now that it wasn't his uncle, it was his father's cousin. Close enough. Anyway, so Tokdamish is welcomed back in. However, in 1373, while Urus Khan was yet again marching west to try and take Sarai, Tokdamish was back home and took advantage of the Khan's absence and started a rebellion against him. Urus Khan, upon hearing about this, immediately turned around, raced home, and squashed all the feeble attempts of this rebellion. So Tokdamish, for a second time, humbly presented himself to the Khan with apologies, and he asked for mercy. And Urus Khan again granted this to him for a second time. Thus, although humiliated and defeated, Tokdamish was still alive. In the year 1375, Urus Khan was able to capture the city of Sarai, and this caused Tokdamish to become scared or possibly embittered. Because Tokdamish wasn't just some guy. He was actually a descendant of Jochi, who was in turn the eldest son of Genghis Khan. 
Now, this didn't really set Tokdamish aside too much. There were plenty of direct descendants of Genghis Khan in the area, including Urus Khan. But what it did mean is that technically, Tokdamish did have a claim to the throne of the Golden Horde. And now that Urus Khan had taken Sarai, coupled with the fact that Tokdamish had fled or rebelled against him twice, maybe Urus Khan wouldn't like the idea of Tokdamish being alive or free to plan things behind his back. Thus, upon hearing that Urus Khan had taken Sarai in 1375, Tokdamish fled. And Tokdamish fled to the only place he could think of. He had heard about another warlord upstart who had seized control of the remnants of the Chagatai Khanate. He had heard of Amir Timur. Perhaps this man was exactly the ally Tokdamish would need in order to claim what he believed was his right. The throne to the eastern portion of the Golden Horde, and then, further than that, the throne of the Golden Horde itself. And this brings us back to where we are in the narrative. Tokdamish flees south, and in 1376 he arrives to the court of Timur. Now, imagine for a minute that you are Timur. What are you thinking when this man arrives to your court, begging for protection and possibly for help? You are not a descendant of Genghis Khan, but he is. You do not have any claim to any of the Golden Horde lands, but he does. So do you think about how he might cause you to develop negative relations with Urus Khan and your northern neighbors on the steppe? Do you think about possible betrayal by this young man? Or do you think about what immense possibilities could occur if you do help him? Well, Timur decides to welcome Tokdamish with the warmest of welcomes. This is how the Zafarnama describes it. Timur showed an abundance of joy and did not forget any of the ceremonies and honors which a prince of his merit and birth could expect. For after having entertained him magnificently with all sorts of diversions, he gave him, as well as his officers, so many presents that it would be difficult to number them. They consisted of gold, precious stones, weapons, magnificent belts, riches, a great deal of furniture, horses, camels, tents and pavilions, kettle drums, standards, mares and slaves, and then he did him the honor of calling him his son. See... For Timur, this was a huge opportunity. First of all, we've discussed how Timur wasn't a descendant of Genghis Khan, but he knew, as well as anybody, just how important that name and family was. Thus, he always tried to link himself to the Khan of Khans in any way possible, whether it meant taking a wife who was the descendant, whether it was establishing puppet Khans who were descendants, or in this case, befriending and adopting a descendant. For the more that Timur is related to Genghis Khan, the more authority and merit his power has. Secondly, this is a great way for Timur to expand his power and influence outwards, outside of Mawarnar and into the rest of the world. For although the name Timur was not yet one that the world knew, the political entity of the Golden Horde was one of the most powerful and most known political entities that the world had seen in the last century. Tokdamish might be Timur's open door into that world. Thirdly and finally, Timur was not a fool when it came to military matters. Grooming and placing an ally to the north of him would mean that his northern borders could be left somewhat unguarded and would let him use those troops and resources elsewhere. Thus, Timur made Tokdamish his son. He gave him all sorts of riches. He gave him the governance of the cities of Otrar, Sabran, and Sairam, which sat on the Sir Darya River. He gave him a small army, and then he told him to take back what was rightfully his, the throne of the eastern half of the Golden Horde. So Tokdamish did just that. Or at least he tried. He went with his new army back into the territory of Urus Khan, and he began pillaging and raiding. Urus Khan, in return, sent his own son, Katlak Buka, to deal with this. Tokdamish and Kutluk Buka met in battle, and Tokdamish was soundly defeated and forced to flee. However, during the battle, even though Kutluk Buka had won, a stray arrow had hit him in, in the encounter, and he bled out and died. His body was brought back to his father, who was understandably outraged. He had forgiven Tokdamish twice, and Tokdamish had repaid him by invading his land, killing his people, and murdering his son. 
Meanwhile, Tokdemish had fled back to Timur. Timur, in response, welcomed Tokdemish back, and he gave him a new set of warriors and equipment. So, Tokdemish wasted no time in invading north for a second time. And for a second time, Urus Khan sent another one of his sons to deal with the young upstart. Urus's other son was named Toktakia, and once again these forces crushed Tokdemish in battle. In fact, the battle was such a crushing defeat that Tokdemish's forces were entirely slaughtered or scattered. Tokdemish himself had been shot by an arrow in the hand, he was thrown from his horse, and he had to jump into the Sir Darya River to escape. While in the river, he had to, of course, strip off all of his armor and equipment, and were told that he eventually made it to a small wooded area on the riverbank where he emerged, covered in blood from his wound, naked, crying with despair, and collapsing due to a fever of shock that had overcome him. And it's here where Tokdemish's story likely would have ended if it hadn't been for a man named Edeku. Edeku was a close friend of Timur's, also from the Barlas tribe, whom Timur had sent to keep an eye on Tokdemish. So Edeku was able to track the man down, gave him first aid and food, and helped him recover enough to make it safely back to Timur. Tokdemish and Timur reconvened, this time in the city of Bukhara, and for a third time, despite having lost two of Timur's armies, Tokdemish was welcomed in by his adoptive father. But... While in Bukhara, messengers arrived to Timur's court, and they brought with them a message from Urus Khan himself. We're told the message was as follows. Tokdemish has killed my son and has fled for refuge to you. You ought to deliver up this prince, who is my enemy. For if you refuse to do it, I declare war against you, and there remains nothing for us to do but to meet in the field of battle. To this... Timur somewhat surprisingly responded with, To the great Urus Khan, I humbly seek your forgiveness, bow my head to you, and will return the traitor Tokdemish to you with all haste. No, I'm totally kidding. This is a mere Timur we're talking about here. This is actually how he, re how he responded. Tokdemish has put himself under my protection, and I will defend him. Return to Urus Khan and tell him that not only do I accept his challenge, but my preparations are already begun, and my valiant soldiers have no other occupation than the trade of war. They are lions who, instead of living in forests, have their residence in camps and armies. Yeah, those are some fighting words if I've ever heard any. And Timber decides if you want something done right, you gotta do it yourself. If Tokdemish had failed twice to defeat the forces of Urus Khan, Timur would do it himself. Thus, we're nearing the end of 1376. Urus Khan gathers his armies of the eastern portion of the Golden Horde. Timur gathers his, and the two forces meet north of the Sir Darya River near the city of Otrar, which would be in eastern Kazakhstan today. Now, this area, being right at the base of the Karatu Mountains, is known to experience very severe and quick weather changes. Weather can drastically change in just a matter of days during the winter. And this, unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately for the two armies, is exactly what happens. While both armies are camped in view of each other, Yazdi tells us this. Their vast armies were ready to make great havoc, when an unnatural cloud overshadowed them and showered them with an incredible amount of rain and snow, which was followed with so excessive a cold that the limbs of men and their beasts lost all motion. The weather continued thus for almost three months, during which time the armies were in full view of each other, but neither capable of action. So the next time somebody tells you about how hard and cold their winter was, remind them that Timur's army was quite literally freezing to death for almost three months, not knowing if an attack could come at any moment during the winter of 1376 and 1377. But anyway, it is now the early part of 1377. The winter is ending and both armies are still situated against each other when two things happen. First of all, a messenger arrives to Timur's war council with a terrible message. While Timur and the army were gone, one of Timur's old enemies had invaded. Yusuf Sufi of the Sufi dynasty of Khwarezmia had taken advantage of Timur's absence and had laid waste to much of Mawarnar. 
carrying people off as slaves, and then he had even attempted to take the mighty city of Bukhara. Although the Khwarezmians were unable to take the city, their invasion had been devastating and Timur's people were suffering and unprotected. Timur had more or less fought three wars against Khwarezmia up to this point, which we've covered, but this invasion proved that they were still a serious threat and needed to be dealt with once and for all. The other thing that happened during the end of this standoff is that once the snow and rain had started to slow down, both Urus Khan and Timur sent detachments of their armies to move out and surprise the enemy. Timur sent, we were told, 500 men in the dead of the night to march to the enemy camp and then surprise them in the morning with an ambush. And it worked out pretty well. And although this was not a decisive turning point in the battle, the soldiers of Urus Khan were shaken that they had been so easily attacked. Many of them had been killed, and Urus Khan's own son, Timur Malik, had been wounded in the encounter. Having already lost a son in this war, Urus might have been shocked that he had almost lost a second one here as well. As for the soldiers that Urus Khan sent out to attack Timur, the idea was for them to flank around the Timurid army in order to surround them. However, some of Timur's reinforcements and scouts had managed to catch this flank attempt and defeated it. Thus, although the majority of both armies still lay intact and both leaders were alive, Urus Khan decided to make a tactical retreat back to his country. Timur was very happy to do the same because his land and people had just been attacked and he needed to sort all of that back home. After ensuring that the Khwarezmians had left his land and that his empire was safe for the time being, Timur regathered his army and invaded the land of Urus Khan in the spring of 1377 and we're told that Tokhtamish rode at the head of Timur's vanguard, and the army marched pretty much unopposed into Golden Horde territory. They arrived at an unguarded city, which is unhelpfully just referred to as a place of reeds for the deer, but they came to the city and they burned it to the ground, slaughtering or enslaving all of the inhabitants and looting anything of value, and then returned home to Mawarnar. And it's sometime shortly after this that Timur and Tokhtamish got word of some interesting political developments. Urus Khan, leader of the eastern half of the Golden Horde and claimant of the entire Horde, had died. One of Urus's sons, Tokhtakia, who had defeated Tokhtamish a few months before, had taken his father's throne, but he too died only after ruling for about two months. Finally, a third son of Urus Khan, Timur Malik, took control of the eastern half, but this quick change in leadership likely meant that the situation was unstable and volatile at best. And so it was not long before Tokhtamish began receiving visitors and supporters who pledged their loyalty to him and pleaded for his return to the eastern half of the Golden Horde. Yazdi tells us that Timur Malik was a terrible ruler. All he did all night and day was party with women and wine, and he would even sleep in every morning until 10 o'clock. Can you imagine that? Anyway, whether this is true or not, or just Timurid propaganda added later, we don't know. But nevertheless, it was now or never for Tokhtamish. After learning about this situation, Timur outfitted Tokhtamish with a third army and told him to invade north and defeat Timur Malik. And so, Tokhtamish promptly does one of those two things. He does invade north, yes, but Timur Malik meets him in battle and Tokhtamish is soundly defeated for a third time. Even Yazdi sounds like he's just so over Tokhtamish's string of defeats. All he says about this battle is... In short, Tokhtamish was again entirely vanquished. So, for a fourth time, Timur welcomes Tokhtamish back, gives him more soldiers and supplies, and sends him north again. Timur also organized something like a Karl Tai, in which Golden Horde tribal leaders who were loyal to Tokhtamish officially announced that Tokhtamish was the true and rightful Khan of the eastern half of the Golden Horde. And I guess fourth time's the charm here, because a year or two after this, either in 1378 or 1379, Tokhtamish was finally able to defeat Timur Malik. 
They fought somewhere on the coasts of the Aral Sea, Timur Malik died in the conflict, and Tokhtamish became ruler of the eastern half of the Golden Horde. Now, he was not the ruler of the entire Golden Horde. If you remember that three-part checklist of becoming Khan of the Golden Horde I shared earlier, Tokhtamish hasn't even completed one of the three tasks. The western half, which was arguably more powerful, was not under his control. The capital of Sarai was not under his control either. And third, the, the warlord slash con maker Mamai was still doing his thing down in the Crimean Peninsula. Nevertheless, Tokhtamish has established himself as a very possible contender for maybe reuniting the Golden Horde in the future. And further, Timur's sphere of influence has suddenly increased drastically. And now he has a powerful ally involved in the politics of the Golden Horde. We are far from done with this uh, the story of Tokhtamish. His story has really only just begun, so try and remember his name. However, for the time being, we're going to have to leave Tokhtamish with his struggle amid the Golden Horde and return to Timur during the years of 1377 and 1378. But unfortunately, it's here that I'm, I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is that I'm going to wrap this half of the episode up, but the good news is that the other half of the episode is out too, uh, under part two. I just wanted to break this episode into two portions to make it somewhat more digestible. But with that, thank you so much for listening to the Timmer Podcast. If you want to reach out to me, you can do so via Twitter or X, whatever it's called now, or on Facebook at Timmer Podcast. Or feel free to email me at timmerpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to support the show, you can do so on Patreon at, at patreon.com slash timmerpodcast. And I'd also like to give a huge thanks to anybody who has donated past or present. I haven't really advertised the Patreon account at all until today. So if you went out of your way to search for it, not knowing that it existed, that meant a lot to me. So thank you. Anyway, I will see you, like, really soon. Seriously, the next episode is out and it's ready, and it's somewhat of a smooth transition from where we are right now. So, anyway, I will see you soon next time right here on the Timber Podcast. Mm -hmm.